Well, they failed in part because there's a battle amongst different diplomats, different countries, different peacemakers to be the ones that are leading the way in resolving the conflict. And so we had a first initiative that was really led by the United States and Saudi Arabia, primarily focused on trying to achieve ceasefires in the early days of the conflict. There was a ceasefire one day and it was broken the next, and this repeated um, uh, on a number of occasions. Um, since then, the US has sort of backed off that initiative, realizing that it's not achieving much, and into the fray, uh, primarily two different competing uh, regional players have come up, sorting, see, sought to make peace. The IGAD, which is the regional organization of African states in East Africa, primarily led by Kenya and Ethiopia, um, have launched an initiative. But just very recently, Egypt also launched its own initiative and invited a number of states to, to, to come to a meeting that it held in Cairo. Um, so what we're seeing is competing initiatives and the, the armed movements in this case, the two belligerents, the Sudan army and the rapid support forces, are very adept at navigating these kinds of rivalries amongst diplomats, all the while gaining some legitimacy uh, and deferring real action while they prosecute the war on the ground. Um, Are we so going to see, I, I'm sorry to jump in there, because uh, you said that efforts from Saudi Arabia and the United States have, for the most part, failed to bear fruit. So given that, can we see regional heavyweights like Egypt step in and hopefully resolve things? Well, so long as there's no coherent single initiative um, that the players, uh, the, the protagonists in the conflict feel compelled uh, to relate to, any of these initiatives are liable to fail. Uh, it's too easy for them to do what is called forum shopping and move between one initiative and the other and play off one against the other. So uh, the, the, the promise in either of these initiatives that's led um, by the African states as such or by Egypt, um, I think is very low. Uh, what really is also more troubling is that both sides, both parties to the conflict, really feel that they can uh, win this convincingly and militarily. So, so long as that's the case, any of the initiatives that are diplomatic are all, also very hard to get traction. We have reports coming in today that uh, internet and uh, cell phone networks in the capital Khartoum have been cut. Uh, we also have reports uh, from the UN that mass graves have been found in a Western Darfur. How bad can things get? Well, I think we can say this much. Three months into the conflict, this is for many of us who have observed it, um, looking like the worst case scenario. And the worst case scenario was that both sides would continue to think that they could win this militarily. Um, the cutting of telecommunications networks today seems most likely to be associated with a Sudan armed forces initiative to regain the upper hand um, with a ground attack um, in certain areas. Um, but largely the Sudan armed forces, the, the army of the country has failed to secure a number of key locations, including in Khartoum. Uh, and its, uh, its, its control is, is limited to certain regions of the country, certainly not in the West and certainly not parts of Khartoum. Um, it has air superiority, whereas the rapid superior support forces is very effective on the ground and in urban centers, um, operating often within civilian environments. So while they both think that they can actually win this war, and while they both have very different strengths and weaknesses and regional strengths, um, this war just continues to get worse. And it really is conflagrating what we've seen in Darfur, in, in, in certainly since the start of the conflict, but especially in the last six weeks um, is, tr is the worsening of the violence, um, not primarily always um, uh, violence between the Sudan armed forces and the rapid support forces, but also with other actors getting involved. Besides the, the forced migration, what are some of the other risks uh, that could happen if this conflict were to def you know, evolve into an all-out civil war? Well, it's hard to know what it's it's not if it's not a civil war at the moment in some respects, because you have two armed forces, um, very large ones, um, with their own, to some extent, constituencies um, fighting a war. It's not just a war between two generals anymore, um, even though the simplicity of that might seem to make it easier to resolve. Um, the, the level of suffering of the Sudanese, I mean, you've talked about the, the numbers displaced over three million, um, the deaths which really are, un, are unreckoned at the moment. We really don't have a good grip on the civilian deaths, but also just the destitution and suffering, um, the targeting, the pillaging, um, the, you know, the, the, the uh, destruction of health facilities, of markets, of livelihoods. Um, this could play out at a scale within Sudan for the, the, the many millions of Sudanese across the country in ways that are 
unimaginable. And that's the first concern above all. Um, certainly beyond that, there is the concern of some um, contagion into the region, um, that the regional actors getting involved and are, that are vying to be involved, but also, for example, with Chad, that the very spillover mm. into Chad of displacement as well as armed groups creates new dynamics that we can't see right now. But first and foremost, it's the Sudanese um, who are bearing the brunt in a very severe way.